Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules to work. <laughs> the first item on the agenda is your the minutes of the last meeting. And I will move approval. Representative Meyer moves that the minutes of the last meeting be approved. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All those say nay. And the minutes have been approved. First item on the agenda. Um, Department of Public Service, Commercial Buildings, Energy Standards. Um, and speaking for the department, uh, Barry Murphy, Department of Public Service, Energy Planning and Resources Division. Um, Mr. Murphy, while you're taking your seat, the committee will please identify itself. Barry Murphy with the Department of Public Service. <laughs> And I'm Allison Bates, along with the Department of Public Service. Sorry, I was not on the list. <laughs> I'm Senator Joe Bennett from Caledonia mm -hmm. County. Representative Linda Myers from Essex Town. Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Uh, Mark McDonald, Senator from Orange County, filling in for the chair, Robert Jesse Cashman, who is yet to go out. Representative Marcia Gardner from Richmond. Uh, Representative Trevor Squirrel, Chair of Fernando. Uh, okay. Thank you for coming this morning. The floor is yours. To uh... thank you for having us. Um, as I previously mentioned, Allison Bates Wanup, and on behalf of the Department of Public Service, I present the revised proposed commercial building energy standards, or CBs as we call it, on Proposal Rule 19-P42. As the committee likely recalls, the committee objected to the department's previously proposed CBS rule on the limited grounds due to a copyright notice contained in that rule. The prior rule contained copyrighted material, the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC, integrated with non-copyrighted but non specific changes to the IECC. The committee objected to the copyright notice in the rule as it had in 2011 and 2014 as being inconsistent with federal case law. The department examined Elkar's objection and reviewed the law on this issue. The department determined that the public interest was best served by resolving Elkar's grounds for objection. The department did so by removing, or attempted to do so, by removing the copyright material from the rule. The rule now contains only the Vermont specific changes to the IECC and incorporates copyrighted material by reference. This is consistent with case law in the Second Circuit, of which Vermont is a part. The revised final proposed rule thus contains no copyrighted material and no copyright notice. This was the same method employed with the residential building energy standards, which on November 14th, LSR voted to withdraw its objection and adopt that, approve that rule. So the revised CBES upon being adopted will be available on the Secretary of State's website, which was a previously identified concern with LCAR. And the public will have the same level of access to the rule as it did previously, meaning that there will be a free viewable copy of the Vermont specific changes fully integrated with the IECC available online and the public can obtain free copies by contacting the department. Um, I also should follow up about the letter that we sent yesterday. Apologies that we were not able to get it in by Tuesday, but the issue was only shortly identified to us, or at least one of them. Um, so the letter that we sent yesterday identified two additional changes to make to the uh, proposed rule. The first, which if you have questions, I will defer to Mary on, um, is regarding um, clarifying that one option for compliance is available. And the second is um, changes certain language on the cover page of the rule so that the rule could track any changes to the IECC, which will be forthcoming. We recently learned that there is a methodological error in the IECC that was created by the International Code Council, and the International Code Council is working to fix that error, and we want our rule to incorporate the material as it may be changed to remedy that error. So. It's often the case, the technical do's and don'ts of rules often take more time and explanation than the, uh, the substance. <laughs> um, are there any questions for the witness? Um, okay, 
Let's our council. Um, do you have any comments to make on the presentation? Thanks, Mr. Chair. To reiterate what uh, Ms. Wamba already stated, the CB's rule as revised or proposed to be revised by DPS does remove the copyright issue that was the sole grounds for this committee objecting last time. Uh, now, as she has already stated, there is no purported copyright on this rule. Instead, the CVs incorporates by reference a separately copyrighted uh, material. So I do believe this addresses the copyright issue that was um, objected to before. So we already approved the rule in balance. All we're doing now is removing our own language that suggested we objected to that portion that's now been approved. If you uh, believe that the issue has been addressed, um, legally I do think it has been addressed like you did with Arby's, the first motion would be to withdraw your objection. And then if you did want to move forward and approve the rule in its entirety, the second motion would be to approve the rule as modified if you do want to incorporate these modifications. But in our previous approval, it's an awkward way because we didn't really approve, we had language in there that said if we object to this particular provision. That's correct. So we have to remove that piece of language mm -hmm. from what we did before. You would withdraw your original objection. So moved. <laughs> it's been moved that the original objection to the rule um, that the committee withdraw the objection. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Let me say nay. And I um, think council will tell us uh, what we, we might do next, which is to prove the rule is, is unnecessary and, uh, and uh, double protection, or, <laughs> or we could simply remain silent. What's the committee's pleasure? Well, I think we had a footnote, if I read all this correctly, that okay. said although LCAR approved these rules, that in explanatory language about what we were thinking was not appropriate. We need to remove that now. That is correct, but that's for the letters of the, to the committees of jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Um, you still have this rule pending in front of you with the department's proposed modifications today. So the second motion, if, you, if one wants to make it, would be to move to approve the rule with the modifications proposed by the department. So moved. So then it has moved to approve the rule now that it's been gussied up in a proper fashion. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. And the group has been approved as uh, thanks to the hard work of the department who has uh, solved the problem. Let us do this. Thank you well, very much. Well, and thank you to Elgar and particularly to Legislative Council for her <laughs> uh, gracious help and support. It's usually a team effort and such things come with us. Thank you, Council. Representative Justin Tantrum, welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to address um, the memo to the Committee for Jurisdiction now with Senator Benning that was uh, oh. bringing up. Um, <clears throat> yes. So did we. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you very much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Council's prepared letter. Would you yes. like me to address this? Yes. Um, so, do you have in your packet the draft letter to the committees of jurisdiction that sets forth the issues that um, were raised during testimony on the RBs and CBs? And as Senator Benning had already uh, brought up, this current draft memo was the one that you had already seen which at the time, um, at the state of those rules, you had objected to those copyright portions. So as I indicated in my email to you, and thank you to Charlene for providing that, um, now you have withdrawn both objections and you've approved both of the rules. So as I noted in my email, um, now that you've done that, you could amend this memo to say, although LCAR approved these rules, LCAR's review of rules has a limited scope. So that um, highlighted text, in the first paragraph of that memo could be revised to read, although LCAR approved these rules, instead of although LCAR approved the majority of these rules. And also, you would delete the footnote that referred to your objection. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any? Go ahead, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, council has stated its position eloquently. Is there any discussion? Uh, not, then 
entertain a, a motion to revise the, our le letter to committees of jurisdiction, as indicated. And to send to them? And to send to them. Okay. So uh, motion to approve to modif approve modification of the letter to committees of jurisdiction for sending. Okay, those in favor say aye. Aye. So those opposed say nay. Thank you. Thank you. This reminds me of those cowboy movies where the, the horseman overtakes the railroad train and deftly jumps off onto the uh, onto the moving cars and goes about his business. <laughs> uh, welcome aboard. <laughs> um, so, and uh, I got a text from Senator Bray that he would be, it was delayed, but will be arriving around 10 30. Uh, the second next rule up is 19 P64, Department of Health, the rules of the Board of Medical Practice. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for having me. I'm Cheryl Livingston with the Health Department. The rule in front of you, um, you actually saw the emergency rule that we brought to you um, that looked similar. Um, however, you gave us some great feedback on that rule, and so this does look slightly different. Um, just to refresh everybody's memory, the purpose of this rule is to update the way in which we approve um, the the credentials of individuals seeking uh, a medical license in Vermont if they were foreign trained. And what happened was we were basing that on a list compiled in by the Board of Medical Practice in California, and they stopped updating that. Um, and so now we needed a new methodology uh, to ensure that individuals seeking licensure in Vermont um, who were properly trained could get a license in practice here. Um, I'll explain the modification that was made since you last saw this. Um, there, there was also a list of unapproved schools that was maintained by California. And we had a, as Senator Benning pointed out, confusing way of having that included in um, the emergency rule. And upon review and discussion with other states and with practitioners, we uh, removed that. So now, it's very straightforward. It's just that it has to have been on the California list or on the, the new list. And so we changed the grammatical structure of the, of the paragraph um, so that it, it was more straightforward. Imagine. I know. <laughs> I just, I just it was fun. For the moment, was I right? Is that what you're <laughs> Do I have to say that? No. <laughs> you made an excellent point. Can we put that in the minutes? Do you think that's the substance of the minutes? <laughs> Um, I have a question you, uh, in your letter. The, the section of the rules would be 2.6.3. And it's um, the last sentence. Um, someone who meets, uh, meets all eligibility requirements for such certification and is only lacking current licensure. Um, yes. And... Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm assuming that implicit in that is that they will then get the licensure Correct. that's missing. You got it. Uh, it probably doesn't need spelling out. But yeah, but that's exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was my only point. Is that if people have questions for things? Uh, I will approval. Uh, Senator Bennett, oh. have a question for you. Okay. Um, you had indicated that California is no longer okay. no longer holds a list or produces a list. Did I understand that correctly? All right. Because so they, the annotated text version on page one has definitions of a board approved medical school means a medical school that and then two point six point one says appears on the official California recognized medical schools list. Is there still a list that's kept? So let me, let me clarify that. There is still a list that exists. 
it is not being updated. updated. Okay. Right. And some of the newer lists didn't exist when somebody might have gone to school. Okay. You got Following it. that particular rabbit hole, if a medical school drops out of accreditation, are yeah. they removed if the list is not maintained? Are they removed from that list? So the, ca the California list would not change. So um, if I went to school in 1985 um, and that school was accredited and on the California list that time, then I would be fine if that school then dro subsequently dropped off and my grandson went to school that same school um, and it was no longer accredited and it wasn't on the new list at the time of accreditation then it would not count but if it's the list temporal. is not maintained <clears throat> will it be removed from the list so it's temporal so you know we the lists are give you the timing right so you know when the person graduated or got their diploma or whatever I think that's what you get from out of the school uh, when you uh, when you graduate, that is the time at which it's important that that school was accredited. So we don't want to take off the California list. No, I because I understand the that. other lists don't have but, that time. But if, if your grandson graduates yeah. from a school five years from now, yeah. from a school that is on the list yeah. now, but in five years no longer meets those guidelines. Yeah. That's my understanding is that because the list is not maintained, that school would not be removed from the list. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all they have to do is graduate from a school that's on the list. Right. And, but it, but, but it's, it's not an accurate, no longer an accurate. But list. we wouldn't use the California list for somebody graduating today. Okay. Right. So somebody graduating today would use the maintained <clears throat> lists, the lists that are current. It's But those current lists didn't exist in 85. The California list, or I think it was the California list, but the, the California list existed at that point. And so it is a temporal issue, right? But the only way for you to determine whether they are valid or not is to ask the question, what school did you go to? And you refer to the California list that is not currently being maintained. And if that school subsequently does not meet the criteria, mm -hmm. how would you know that the individual graduating from said school is actually eligible under our criteria now if what you're doing is enabling them to come in under this particular rule as it's written? Let me, hold on, I'm not explaining it well. Let me think about it if I'm going to explain it. Um, so... Can I take a shot at it? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So looking at someone who has graduated from a foreign medical school in 2022, mm -hmm. you would not refer to the California list. Right. Because that list was only maintained up until 2020. Right. So going forward, you refer to the other lists. The California list is only prior to this date. Right. But it might be somebody who's, you know who's applying for a Vermont license today who graduated in 85, and then we would use the California list to verify. Yeah. So we need it there still, even though that's annoying, because it'd be great if we could just take it off altogether. But the reason we didn't want to keep the, the point that you had made was we don't want to keep the unapproved list, because that was so confusing, because it could have been on an unapproved list, and now it's approved. And that just muddied the waters in a way that wasn't helpful. The only question is, it not been wise to have a statement to the effect that they appear on the official California recognized medical schools list as of X date, whatever that is? Um, we could put that in there, but that's not, I mean, th so the trouble in when, we, when we talk to other states, that's not how they have done it. And then that's not when we talk to the provider groups and the medical practice board. Um, the concern was another issue that you find is that somebody went to a school and it wasn't accredited while they were there. Then it got accredited right before they graduated. 
How and in that, and so you want to be able to leave these rooms so that there is flexibility <coughs> for the board to recognize somebody who is truly qualified and trained. The cut date for exactly when California did or didn't stop doing their, you know, their updating is less critical than knowing that the school was actually accredited at that time. And that's something that, while I understand this committee has been grappling with the best way to word, in practice is very straightforward. It's not a it's not a complicated like I graduated at this date and you look at the list you say great that school was approved at that period. Representative Gardner. So let me see if I understand this. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you not only ask the um, person what school did you graduate from, you also ask what year. Correct. And that's what you look at. Was that school accredited and at, at that time? At that time. Thank you. Got it. Can I ask how you learn that? It's in the application. No, I mean, once you have decided what school they went to and what year, mm -hmm. does the board actually go into the history of the school to determine at that year that they were actually yes. accredited? Okay. The staff do, but yes, <laughs> but yes, they do. Yeah. So, and and we don't have. The other thing for the community, no, we don't have hundreds of these up. You know, it's not like this is some huge workload. It's not, yeah. It's not. So Legislative Council just pointed out that that is addressed in 15.2.5. Then that was another comment from Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Last time around. No, it was a while ago. But. I actually asked David Hurley if we could like show you the application, and you have to like have a login, whatever. Yeah. Not being too much of a hassle, but <laughs> that'd be fun. Okay, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. Is there any further discussion? I have a motion to approve the uh, rules of board medical practice as amended. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed to nay. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Okay, this we're right on the schedule. Uh, next rule is 19 P67, Department of Health, the Vital Records Rule. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Brendan Atwood. I'm a policy advisor with the Department of Health. And with this rulemaking, the department is proposing to amend the vital records rule. The purpose of the vital records rule is to establish the requirements for creating, obtaining, storing, and disposing of birth and death certificates in Vermont. And with this rulemaking, the department is improving access to these records for those who need them in the following ways. Uh, first, this rulemaking would incorporate the changes made in the existing emergency rule that expand the list of alternate means of identification in order to make it easier for inmates um, and former inmates to um, apply for a certified copy of a birth certificate. And um, this will help these folks more easily obtain a driver's license or employment. And this change was made in accordance with Act 80 of 2019. This rulemaking will also allow Vermont State employees to use their state employee identification to request and obtain birth and death certificates when conducting official business. This was a change made at the request of DCF and DIVA whose employees need access to these records for issues related to custody, um, adoption, and the provision of benefits. Um, and this essentially reestablishes what had been the status quo prior to um, Act 46 of 2017. And then this rulemaking would also establish a process through which an individual experiencing homelessness can work with a homeless services provider to apply for a certified copy of a birth certificate. Again, this would make it easier for these folks to obtain a driver's license or employment. Um, and this was an issue that was brought to our attention by a number of uh, town clerks and a state representative. Um, and then finally, a number of formatting and citation revisions have been made. And in drafting this rulemaking, the department worked with the Department of Corrections, the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association, as well as the, <clears throat> the Vermont Coalition on Homelessness. So they've all reviewed these changes and provided support throughout the rulemaking process. And so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. 
Um, I want to note that we have a, uh, a letter from Senator White enthusiastically stating that this <laughs> meets uh, legislative intent, or statutory intent. Um, I do have one question. It's, uh, in a, if you look at the annotated rule, it's the, the first definition, 3.1, about the affidavit of homelessness status. Yes. Um, and it, uh, so it's used to verify an individual status for the purpose of obtaining birth certificate. So is that a temporary designation? How long does it last? How long? When is someone not a homeless person? It's officially? and it is just used um, essentially as another form of identification, um, whereby a homeless services provider is essentially um, verifying that person's uh, both their identity and their status as homeless. And so, um, one of the requirements of the identification is that it establishes an address. And so, these folks, in most cases, don't have an address unless they're at a shelter. So um, it would only be for the purposes of that single request for that certified copy of a birth certificate. So it's not a like an ID card. No, it's ID not. Card. No, and actually, I do have a, a copy. If it would be helpful to see um, what that the affidavit looks like. I'm, I'm curious, but I think it's not a, not necessary. I've got examine it. Representative Gardner. Uh, you may not know this, but I'll throw this question out anyway. How are you? How is the Department of Health coming along with the database as far as a statewide accessible database of all births and deaths? I don't know the answer okay. to that question. I'm Thank sorry. you. Yeah. I know there were a few hiccups along the way, and yeah. And if, and if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to to get them to the right people and get answers for you. Okay. Thank you. Any further mm -hmm. questions? Not entertain a motion to approve the rule. So moved. Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that out there once. Yeah, um, yeah I don't think it's an exclusive. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, unless there are further questions, there's a motion to approve the rule as presented. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, 19P71, Department of Financial Regulation, Insurance Regulatory Sandbox, Organization of Labor Regulation. A little early there. Yeah. Sandbox for a terrible art. That was my only question. <laughs> 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 That's one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll uh, object to that rule. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, from the Department of Health, successes with the Court of Federal again. Uh, P68, disorder treatment certification. So, hello again. This is Jay Livingston from Health Department. Lots of us today. Um, I was part of some of that testimony, not related to the sandbox specifically, but in that bill last year, and I had all of those same questions and I walked into that committee. Um, all right, so what you have in front of you is almost exclusively a cleanup. Um, department had updated this rule um, and we're, we're doing it again to try to really simplify it and um, make it easier to follow for those seeking, um, for those in the alcohol and drug abuse treatment programs. Um, so this is how we certify treatment at the health department in order for them to receive state and federal dollars. So this is not a licensure. You can still operate as a substance abuse treatment provider in Vermont without this certification. This certification is simply if you are seeking um, tax care funding for your work. Um, the one substantive change that I will note is that we are doing a similar thing that we did in our um, IDRIP rule, the impaired driving rule, where we are changing the requirements um, for the individuals who can supervise for substance abuse treatment. 
um, to make it uniform across the system. Before it was very narrow and it was only for licensed alcohol and drug abuse providers and now um, you can have other licenses as long as of course your specialty is still substance abuse, substance abuse treatment. So um, that now mirrors what's in IDRIP, it mirrors the practices in many of the designated agencies um, and it's, it's a move to really try to address the workforce challenges that we're facing in Vermont um, without in any way compromising any of the treatment to be received by Vermonters seeking care. So that's the, that's the only thing that um, would change practice in this, in this rule. So the, it appears to me that, that uh, this revision uh, bifurcated the existing rule, so there's certification and operation as separate. Um, lo well, looking at yeah. uh, anna annotated text, yes. um, or I guess either one, but the, the 2.0, the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Um, it, the, this rule provides uh, substance use disorder treatment certification for preferred, preferred providers. It previously used to say uh, certification and operational requirements. So where are those operational requirements? Um, yeah, so that so they are still in here. Um, that the the program we talked about the purpose and trying to clean it up. Um, many of the operational requirements before this change, I mean current in current practice. Um, and after are in the guidance documents and the grant requirements that they receive. Um, and so it seemed a little misleading to say that they were in this rule specifically because they are, they are not. They're in the guidance documents and the grants and contracts that those providers get. Um, some of those operations specific things. It's again not actually changing what the rule itself was directing um, in terms of operations. Does that so make sense? Largely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's no operational rule. There's a certification rule, and then operations are guidelines and uh, right. And always have them. And I think we, I don't know why that was in there before, I'll be honest. Uh, other questions? Concerns? Representative Gardner. Um, was there a public hearing? Oh, yes. I know it says in here that there was going to be. Were there any comments from that? I no. Didn't. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we didn't receive comments. Again, uh, we sent it, we also sent it act proactively up to the providers. Um, um, and we didn't receive any public comment during the public comment process. Okay. I did want to just mention that legislative council caught you know, our mistakes as they do, which is wonderful. And so. I hope you do have this um, brief memo with those minor changes. Um, they were. Um, one of them actually is, is more than totally tiny and minor, but that was that we wanted, they, they pointed out that the definition that we were using for um, substance use disorder wanted that to be consistent with statute and other rules, which of course we did too, and um, so we, we updated that. Again, it won't change practice on the ground, but for consistency, that's what's important. So thank you to Ledge Council for this. Senator Benning. Sure, I'd like to go back to the chair's question. Yep. Um, I understood you to say that the operational requirements are not in the rule. It may just be the vernacular that I'm not used to, but on page five of the annotated version, the old rule 3.0 uh, had requirements for certification, which included organizational capacity and accountability. That's being struck. To me, can you, that, can you, sorry, can you just sure. Me I'm on page five of the annotated version. Yeah. 3.0 requirements for certification. The language for certification uh -huh. being struck. Yeah, got it. Got it. 
Um, what follows thereafter appears to me to be an operational governance of some kind in the application process. Does that still exist somewhere else? Um, okay, so that's a great question. So this, the one of the reasons these were struck from um, this section is, and I'm just going to use 3.1.1 as my example, if that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> That is, it's restating what is what is true regardless. Um, and one of the things that we've heard from, just generally, not about this rule specifically, but when we're trying to update these rules, is to try to make them as streamlined and specific as possible so that those reading them don't get sort of mired in a lot of text. Um, and we struck that section because it is required in a different section, and it's um, hold on, that now. in is required that they abide by um, the the guidelines already in the rule, and so this this was is repetitive of that, and that they also abide by regulations is law, and again repetitive. So that's a lot of the the wording that you see struck. It's not that it's no longer true, it's that it it is the law, um, or it is the fact of how you have to operate in order to, to meet requirements. So an example of that would be sometimes in some rules we had like, you have to follow all DEC regulations, or you have to follow all, you know, and, and we've tried to really hone that down to say, you know, in order to get a license, for example, if it's a licensing rule, you have to follow all other state and local laws and regulations and kind of trying to cut out all of this extra language around, you know, so that we're, and also so that we're not confusing the applicants where they're like, well, you said I had to follow DEC's regs and I did, oh, but it turns out that you weren't following whatever, Fish and Wildlife's regs too. And, and they can get nitpicky there about listing versus trying to be more inclusive and more comprehensive. That's the big, but but I mean, I guess the, the substance there, the piece that's substantive there is those service guidelines, and that is still re required in the current rule for, oper for, like for operations. Yeah, and that's where the operations yeah, I are. I think I know where you're going here. You're streamlining and removing the chair's question the operational section of your 2.0 for purpose, but the rule technically does still have operational requirements, it's just that they're umbrellaed under the word certification. You got it. Thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> I had more coffee before I came here this morning. Are <laughs> there any other questions, clarifications, concerns? No. Uh, the purpose no. was to uh, provide more people in the workforce. Yeah. So the main, you, right. So going back to why do this rule now, it, it was about specifically making it clear who can be a supervisor and opening that up to more individuals. For example, somebody with an MSW with a specialization in substance use disorder, even if they did not have an LADC license specifically, we want those people to be able to work there. And as we do every time, of course, we could have made that tiny change and nothing else, but we'll try to clean it up. Always in favor of streamlining. Make that look like a mess. Um, if there is no further discussion, I entertain a motion to approve the rule. Second. I make a motion to uh, approve rule 19B68. Oh, yes, as modified. As modified. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, all those in favor of approving the rule as modified, please say aye. 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 As opposed to nay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Mm -hmm. Chair, if anybody's interested, that you might Google Max Lamara's 100,000. Mm -hmm. okay. Footnote to that comment. Or, uh, <laughs> the Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War initiated a policy of uh, making more soldiers available to 
fight. Did you ever read his book? Yes. Quite powerful. Also a book about his death. I have read it. Is this related to the five o'clock follies? I'm here to ask that. It would be in the same syllabus. <laughs> um, do we have folks from the uh, uh, Department of Financial Regulation here? I, yeah, I know we're running ahead of schedule. Yeah, I emailed Sadash. Okay. And the, the so there's one rule. The other thing is the discussion on the um, race tracks. And for that, I, I don't see uh, the Deputy <coughs> Secretary here. So again, we're way ahead of schedule. Um, I'd like to. Uh, I should be late more often. Um, I'd like to raise the question of the next meeting, the 19th. We have two rules scheduled. Um, I don't know what we're looking, how busy it's looking for the 9th, January 9th. I don't have that. Um, so I'm, and I will be away at the time, and we'd like to propose that we, if we can, postpone uh, both, of both of those rules until January 9th, regular meeting. And if anyone has concerns about that, there. Except we re require an extension to yeah. do that. Yeah. You'd have to request an extension from the administration? Yeah. For both or one? No, just for one. Right. The, the first one, uh, P66, uh, ends on 1 4. Right. Oh, we did. Have to make the. What do you want to make the The administration would have to voluntarily I mean, we, they we can extend this request an extension, see if they are willing to do that. Senator Bray. Um, just to make sure I'm understanding, are you uh, proposing canceling the meeting and moving, or just that postponing the date because you won't be able to be here for the discussion? Uh, I'm proposing, because those are the only two rules mm -hmm. on the agenda, I'm postponing, oh, proposing to cancel, cancel that meeting and, and ask for an and, extension. Uh, and ask for an extension, yes. Got it. Just want to make sure. <coughs> Yes, yeah, seven. Perhaps we ask council, but would that mean that we would move to send a letter requesting the extension and then be and ask for them to make a decision by a certain time so we can know whether or not to, that we were still obliged to, to do it on the 19th or we had been freed from that obligation? Uh, yes, we would. Charlie and I will call them to that, yeah. Charlie's normal practice. She has a memo that would be ready to go if they'd be willing to um, extend your review period and say, I'm going to say to the 11th, like the other one. If our meeting's on the next meeting's on January 9th. The next meeting's on January 9th. Okay. So I would move that we uh, schedule the next meeting for January 9th with the provision that that depends upon uh, mm -hmm. the administration um, sending us in there. Better too. Well, there is eight months of adoption period the and extension, the and that if in the event that they don't, we would be find ourselves pledged to come back on the 19th. Um, just a question what's our schedule look like otherwise for the moon? Showing said she's received no rules for the night. No okay. rules. Good. The deadline isn't until Friday. Um, the deadline for the rules for the January 9th is December 31st, so I still have plenty of time for the rules to come in. Well, the only reason I'm nervous for my benefit is my first committee starts at 8 30. And, and in general, we're during session, we're supposed to be the one hour meetings to touch our rules. I don't know if you'll feel 
it's safer to address to have to hold the meeting on the 19th as scheduled. Uh, well, throw the dice and hope the 19th is part of the 9th is in jam. Throw the dice, well. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need a motion to do that? So Senator McDonald. Oh, he did. Okay. Made a motion to uh, ask the send a letter requesting for extension for that as necessary for that rule. And can't be a should, should we receive one? We would not need to go tonight. Or should we be assured by the legislative council that if that's resolved, we would not need to go tonight? on the table to uh, most likely cancel the meeting on the 19th. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Uh, thank you for <coughs> consideration of this <coughs> and, and accommodation. This means I have to start my Christmas shopping earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you have a morning to do it. <coughs> Um, so, in terms of the, uh, the rules remaining, only one. The rule remaining, right? Um, and are, so, are we are still waiting for? Uh, we are. I can't get into. Oh, can um, just see if he sent me something. He hasn't. Let me go downstairs and call him. Okay. We've got a type on Mr. Chair on the agenda about the last uh, subject for discussion being at 155 mm -hmm. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> did I do that? Yes. <laughs> Yep, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say go one. Huh? So we, left, uh, so we left missed that. We were thinking it might I be left. very long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to tell you about my mother, but I'm very bad with names. So. Remember names, but your your name triggers the song, and so I, <laughs> they call the women. Or I, I hear that a lot. I'm uh, sure that I'm actually do. named after a different song, but I hear that. A lot. <laughs> That's my daughter's middle name, Nora. <laughs> The song is uh, from the movie Eddie and the Cruisers 2. Uh, it's Mariah by Joan Caffrey and the Beaver Brown Band. Don't know. Oh, yeah, all right. I don't know. Tell you how old I am when I know the other one. <laughs> question or two of counsel. So on the uh, this section 5.1 of the rule we're looking at, 5.1 and 5.2, um, the highlighted uh, area, highlighted material is things that have brought up questions that we're going to be discussing, correct? But the, the language overall has not changed. It's just a question of Interpretation and enforcement, but there's no change to the rule. Right? That's my understanding. I didn't provide this document. I actually don't oh. know where this came from. Okay. Senator Benning, did you provide this document? Okay. And it's just highlighting the um, parts of the rule that raised concern. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. 
looking at 5.1.9, you know the definition of civil twilight? Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe that's in title one? Is it title? I don't think it's a defined term. Cool. It's the common use term. Well, so far, that, that particular language hasn't been an issue for anybody thus far. <laughs> those three expand on that stuff. Well, if it's a demolition derby, would that be uncivil? Twilight? Yeah. 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 Supposed to light it. Light it that's a different definition. Would you like to Google definition? Yes. Civil twilight is a scientific term, and we define it as the period after sunset or before sunrise ending or beginning when the sun is about six degrees below the horizon and during which on clear days <laughs> there is enough light for ordinary outdoor occupation. <coughs> I don't know six degrees if it's below yeah. the horizon. Yeah, that's very special. have a very tall ladder. <laughs> Only two <laughs> ass. <laughs> Too much in the wings. <laughs> but it is a scientific term, so interesting. <laughs> well, we've reached a point where somebody can call up on their computer or their telephone and get that information. <laughs> It's really scary when you go to give a presentation to a group of school kids and they're all sitting there with their laptops. They know more about you before you open your mouth and it's pretty frightening. <laughs> Wait a minute, you voted this way on that question. That's called transparency. Is that what it is? <laughs> Actually, while we're waiting, yeah. oh, she, she's not here. We could discuss the schedule, which is also on the, 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 our actual schedule for, <coughs> for this year. It's probably wait till Charlotte. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was just wondering if the committee just wants a refresher on what your authority is in regard to reviewing existing rules. I was going to ask okay. that <laughs> question. What, what are our, our options? So LCAR has the authority to review existing rules. It's set forth in the EPA <coughs> under 3 BSA 817 subsection D. And it's saying, in addition to your powers under 842 of the APA, which, you're, which is your authority to object, um, to proposed rules, the statute provides the committee may, in similar manner, conduct public hearings, object, and file objections concerning existing rules. Um, and so this, your authority is the same. Um, you don't have the authority to amend a rule, for example, like you don't have the authority to do so for proposed rules unless the agency consents. Um, but you could object to an, an existing rule um, under your same objection standards that you have for proposed rules. And that doesn't mean that the rule goes away, that just means that if the rule is subsequently challenged, then the burden shifts to the agency to prove that the rule um, does not meet any of the grounds for objection, that it's not arbitrary or contrary to legislative intent, for example. Um, this statute goes on to say that a, a rule reviewed under this subsection remains in effect until amended or repealed um, in accordance with that same principle that the rule you can't stop a rule from um, applying unless the agency takes another step to uh, propose an amendment to it. I think this is an important discussion to have, but I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable not having Chris Winter here sure. during the explanation. And I actually, I see that um, while I was speaking, Sebastian is here now um, for the sandbox rule. Do you know what our the uh, guiding authorizing legislation? Is for this. So I, I would like the Secretary of State's office to confirm, but I am looking at the racing statute, um, and I'm seeing this is in Title 26, where many of our professional regulation statutes are, and in 26 VSA, Section 4811, um, for, under the racing statute, um, 
this statute 4811 is safety standards and in subdivision one uh, it provides that the outside portion of all tracks shall be a reasonable distance from spectators um, so I think that is the applicable language um, from which these rules are derived but I would like the Secretary of State's office to confirm that there's no more specific language for demolition derbies. I haven't been able to find more specific language yet, but I'm continuing to search through this enabling statutory language. Thank you. Uh, as we now have the counsel from Department of Financial Regulation here. Yes. Um, could you join us at, at the table and we can take up Rule 19-P-71? Uh, uh, please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview. Um, my name is Sebastian Arguengo and I represent the Department of Financial Regulation. And I'm here this morning to present to you our proposed rule I-1903, the Insurance Regulatory Sandbox Innovation Waiver Regulation. And um, this regulation um, is being adopted um, under 8 VSA 15 little a. Uh, which was added during the last legislative session. And it allows the Commissioner of Financial Regulation to grant waivers to um, entities with respect to certain areas of Vermont's administrative uh, insurance laws for um, entities who can demonstrate that um, the application of the law would um, inhibit the um, entity's ability to bring innovative products or services to market, um, that the uh, public policy goals of the law or regulation that's being waived could be effectively achieved by other means, and that the waiver won't substantially or unreasonably increase the risk to consumers. And uh, finally, the, com the commissioner has to find that the waiver is in the public interest. Um, so, our regulation allows entities to apply uh, to the commissioner for a waiver and incorporates a process by which the commissioner um, has a period of time to review the waiver application and any supporting documents provided by the entity and to take public input prior to either granting the waiver or uh, denying it. Um, this um, regulation is very much a um, temporary measure as was envisioned by um, statute. Um, in. 2023, um, our ability to grant waivers sunsets, and um, any um, new entities that want to receive waivers um, will not be able to after that time, and any entities that want to renew a waiver um, won't be able to. And um, my um, <laughs> understanding from the committee process last year is that um, the committees of jurisdiction um, after 2023 uh, hope to review um, the waiver process and um, see if this regulation um, actually did succeed in bringing new and innovative insurance products into Vermont that could potentially offer um, small businesses um, different coverages at lower prices than what is currently available. What is the range of insurance 
products that this covers, does that include health? No, it, it doesn't include uh, health. Um, this is for property, casualty, and limited lines. And just to give you an example of the sort of products that are being contemplated um, <coughs> in the uh, UK, which has had um, a waiver process for um, so-called insure tech insurance technology and financial technology products. Um, there are insurance companies that in the life market um, target riskier populations, um, such as um, older smokers, and then um, gives them an app by which they can report back to the insurer on their progress uh, with respect to quitting smoking or adopting healthier habits. And um, through the, the app, um, the insurer dynamically lowers um, the insured's premiums, which wouldn't be allowed under our current um, insurance law, which requires a set premium for a set amount of time. Does that also allow raising the premiums if they, the apps indicate some increasing, increased risky behavior? Right, that's, um, that was also part of their, um, their product. Um, the, the idea behind that particular product is by um, gamifying um, healthier habits and tying that to um, premiums that um, they would encourage insureds to um, be healthier and thus enjoy um, lower premiums if they succeeded and there's the stick also of higher premiums if they smoke more or are less, less healthy um, in their lifestyle. But that's just one example of the, the kind of product um, that could be brought to market under uh, this regulation. And um, of course, the commissioner um, would have a full process for reviewing those products before um, they came to market. <coughs> Other questions? I just have a uh, Senator McDonald. This is for the technology used in delivering the product. Right. Not the behavior or the nature of the policy. That's right. And um, the, the technology that's being used to bring these products um, varies pretty significantly. Um, um, for example, um, Tesla um, has looked into offering car insurance um, that's based off of the telemetry data they receive from the car and the idea is they they know how fast you drive um, when you drive where you drive um, so by incorporating all of that data they can um, offer um, an auto insurance product using a different actuarial method than a traditional um, car insurer. <laughs> Senator Brett. Give us a motorcycle. Just, um, <laughs> <laughs> Has the um, department received any uh, inquiries about this pending rule? I mean, uh, I'm just wondering if there's been a response to it yet. Um, we have received uh, positive feedback from industry, um, we haven't um, we haven't received um, any applications or any um, specific interest 
from uh, insurers that want to bring a specific product to Vermont. Um, but we did receive um, a letter in support of the regulation from the um, Property and Casualty Insurance Association. And I'm just noticing in the between the rules and the underlying statute, no extensions are can be granted after July 1, 2021. And you, um, I'm sorry, that that is correct. Right. And then you can only get 12 months on your initial. So there's really from January 1 of this year to July 1 of this year yeah. to put something in that could ever extend beyond get an extension. That's right. Okay. So it's tight guardrails. Uh, yes. And I, um, I think that the, the underlying statute was uh, enacted with the idea that um, the committees of jurisdiction um, would revisit this in two years um, to see if it is working um, and uh, if it is to extend it and if not to um, pull it back. But this is, this is very much um, meant to be a, a short-term um, trial. I know this is far beyond the scope of this rule and your department, but I'm wondering if there's been any discussion of uh, safeguards on data, you know, collection, sales, use, um, sharing. Uh, yes, um, that will be something that um, we anticipate um, looking at um, when entities apply for waivers. Um, one, um, as part of the application process, um, we're going to be requesting all of the um, technical documents that um, serve as the, the background for the insurer's actuarial calculations or um, how they price the product and use customer data. And um, we... Um, intend to incorporate um, safeguards against um, the use and abuse of customer data in the um, application process. Senator Bray. Um, if when we're done with questions, uh, just to get, I move that we approve Rule 19 P71. Is there further questions or discussion? Are there further questions? Other than love to know about the term sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the term uh, sandbox is uh, it's sort of a term of art to mean that um, we are creating a space for these products um, without a wholesale change to the rest of our insurance laws. So in, in effect, it, it is a sandbox um, where um, we can try out new ideas without um, disrupting the larger market. And I notice it's actually in the underlying legislation. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it is not as fun as an actual sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> is it as gritty? <laughs> I certainly hope not. <laughs> Um, unless there are further questions, it'll, even if there are further questions, we have a motion on the table to <laughs> approve. Uh, Senator McDonald. I'm, I'm on the Committee of Jurisdiction where this passed, and uh, I had reservations that your individual experiments in ought to be authorized by the legislature, not delegated. Um, this has been delegated, it's in statute, uh, and it uh, concerns me, but it's, I believe it to be in statute, and um, I hope the committee I serve on keeps a close eye on it. If there are no further questions or comments, all those in favor of approving the rule say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So, this means you should be here. So, Senator McDonald, I share your concern. It seems as though 
the guardrails are so highly, so tight and well defined. That hopefully, no, no sand gets kicked out of the sand box. Don't play a bite Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, while awaiting the Secretary of State's Deputy Secretary of State, we can look at the post schedule meeting during the session. Um, Senator Benning, thank you for catching the town meeting schedule date. March <coughs> fifth. Do you need a motion to approve the schedule as presented today? Do we need a motion to approve the schedule? <laughs> sure, why not? I support, but not meeting on March 5th, though. You can say you're in the So we're not going to meet on March 5th. Is that? I no, and I took that out. Yeah, there's a revised schedule. Oh, I must have the old one, sorry. Oh, here it is. I have March 5th on both. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Okay. I don't know that we can ever shut down L car but in any period of time, but the, these May dates just remind me of when we're in those final days in the session and things are so packed that sometimes it's pretty challenging to um, be holding L car meetings at the same time. So we have an obligation to be available to respond to rules and keep them moving. Um, just looking at this, I, it looks like March 19th. Yep, that's it. Uh, March 19th. Mm -hmm. So, oh. So it's going to be February 27th, March 12th, March 19th, right? Yes. Okay. I'll send you an advice. And, then okay. Okay. and I'll just say, hearing no objection without the schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are generally meeting at number 10, yeah. unless otherwise noted. We discussed that before you were alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Discussion on uh, the motion derbies, fairs, um, and um, so I guess in, in turn, uh, we, we would like to, to we would also have people representing the fairs here. Uh, and uh, so I, how would the committee like to do this here from? Secretary of State's office and then hear from Fair Association. Uh, or a more squeeze people in in a round table discussion. <coughs> well, since our first discussion included, you know, focused on concerns coming from the fair community, I'd love to hear the Secretary of State's background information on this before we could get to a discussion. With everybody. Okay. I think, Mr. Chair, it's also important to start off with what Betsy Ann was reviewing prior so that now that all sides are in the room, um, they all understand what the parameters are of our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, so, LCAR has the ability to, under the APA, 
to conduct public hearings, object, and file objections concerning existing rules. Um, this is pursuant to the APA and 3DSA 817D. And essentially, the authority of this committee in reviewing proposed rules is the same as reviewing existing rules. You may object to an existing rule just like you may object to a proposed rule. It doesn't do anything to the actual rule itself, but if you do certify an objection and the rule is thereafter challenged in court, then the agency would have the burden of proving that um, the rule, for example, is within its authority or not contrary to the intent of the legislature, or not arbitrary, for example. So I, I, if, if you'd like me to open the door to the conversation, um, the Fair Association knows why the door got open, but Chris, I'll relate this to you now. My understanding is that there has been on the books a rule under the Motor Vehicle Racing Commission, and I'm specifically referring to Rule 5.1, uh, dealing with demolition derbies. Um, Apparently, the rule has never been enforced with respect to the setback requirements until fairly recently. But prior to that, there are five fairs, and the Fair Association can correct me on this later if I'm incorrect. My understanding is that there are five fairs that do not meet the setback requirements as in the rule. Um, the the problem is that the Fair Association's demo derbies are one of the top money earners for fairs. And in the event they are forced to meet the setback requirements, the situation is they will either have to literally pick up their grandstands and move them back, or place the affairs in a different location. But the locations where they currently are are prepared grounds for this very purpose. And they would have to start by preparing a different ground and redesigning their spectator areas at great cost. Um, they obviously don't want to be in that position. I understand that the rule may have originally been written for those facilities like Thunder Road, which have a high-speed um, automotive element to them um, and that this setback requirement would make sense in that circumstance. But to those of us who have been to the derbies, we know these cars are moving maybe five to 10 miles an hour. Um, and I am not aware of any time that anybody in the uh, audience of these events has been injured at such a facility. I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm at least not aware of anybody that has been injured. So the statute in question says that the rule must be reasonable. There's no other language in the statute for that to be defined, unless, Chris, you've got some other um, offering there. We're, we're not aware of anything else that goes beyond that. And the statute in question is 26 VSA, section 4811. Um, that calls for a reasonable distance and no other definition is in the statute. So the rule, we turn to that, and if the rule is suddenly placing uh, these fair associations in the position of spending great expense um, and or making it virtually impossible for them to accommodate this big money earner, uh, the question is, is that then reasonable or is it arbitrary? And that's what has brought us here. Now, I'll let the committee know my thought process here. I am not trying to amend the rule. Um, our legal proscriptions are that we have the power to object to a rule. You then still have the power to try to enforce the rule, but if it was to be appealed in a court of law, the burden would shift to your agency to have to demonstrate that you meet the burden of the legislative intent and whether or not this is arbitrary or not. Um, that almost forces you folks and the fair associations to have a meeting and come up with something that is 
agreeable to all sides to make things work correct. And the second part of that, of my intent that is, is to have us write a letter of jurisdiction, uh, letter uh, to the committees of jurisdiction, advising them of the problem and asking them to have witnesses come in and provide testimony as to whether this is reasonable or not, um, what kinds of accommodations can be met. Um, my own personal feeling is I, I look at the, the rule of 30 foot, foot, 30 foot setback requirement. <coughs> It doesn't even take into account elevation as I see it. Um, so it may be that some of these fares meet the 30 foot requirement if they are elevated to such an extent, but that's a conversation that should be had in the committees of jurisdiction, not with us. So my intent, uh, Mr. Chair, at the end of this discussion is to move to simply say, we object to that uh, portion of the rule which has the 30 foot restriction um, leave it at that and then write a letter to the committees of jurisdiction saying we'd like you to take a look at this um, and take testimony on this subject to try to reach some consensus. That's my introduction. I'm sure the Fair Association who brought it to my attention would like to be able to flesh that out a little bit more as to why it's an impact in that. Um, but I don't care who proceeds first. That's since you're at the table. Very good. Thank you, Secretary. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Chris Winters. I'm the Deputy Secretary of State. Before I was a deputy, I was um, the Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. And before that, a staff attorney for the Office of Professional Regulation. So I'm very familiar with motor vehicle racing. I won't say very familiar, but it's a been a part of my uh, regulatory world for, for quite a while. Um, I'll just say up front that it's, it's not our intent to, to put anyone, anyone out of business. It's not our intent to create an undue hardship for any of these fairs. And we're very much open to having the conversation that Senator Benning has discussed and, and has uh, intends to prompt from, from his motion at the end of this. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background to hopefully help flesh out why I think we're, we're here now and we haven't been here before on this 30-foot rule. Uh, last year, at, at some point, we made a decision to bring our race inspections in-house. They've been um, outsourced to our motor vehicle racing commissioners for a long time. These were great guys that I worked with over many years who knew a lot about racing. Most of them were uh, race car drivers <coughs> themselves. Um, uh, they, they did a wonderful job for us and brought a lot of knowledge to the table. They were dedicated, they were honest, they were um, doing a very good job for us, but they really didn't have regulatory experience um, and uh, around inspections, enforcement, due process. Uh, we did work with them to try to kind of document what they were doing and, and make sure that all the tracks were complying with the both the statutes and the rules, all the laws that were on the books around motor vehicle racing and around demolition derbies. Um, we were interested in having more predictability, both for, for us, for the public, for the regulated community, um, more documentation and more consistency in how they were going to these tracks and doing the inspections and citing violations or not citing violations. Uh, we found out that there were times when the tracks were grandfathered uh, or otherwise exempted from the statutes and the rules, uh, and that went back a long ways, and we really don't have any record of how or why uh, some of those practices were allowed to continue. Maybe it was a, a very reasonable decision at the time, we just don't have the documentation of how that decision was made. Uh, so now we're finding ourselves in this conversation. We're having our own inspectors do the inspections with those advisors alongside for their expertise. Uh, but we have our inspectors going out. We're doing more documentation. We're trying to be uh, very careful in, in making sure there's compliance. And uh, our mission is public protection and to make sure that we're protecting the public through the regulation that this legislature has put on the books, this governor has signed, our previous governor's previous legislatures. Uh, and we're trying to carry that out. Um, and we find ourselves with this 30-foot setback rule and no real explanation as to whether that's the right thing for every track or why some may have been exempted. Um, so we realize that's a, that's a problem for some of the tracks. We started kind of running into uh, concerns from them that 
like having to move their grandstands. It's going to be impossible. It's going to be very expensive. So that's why we've started the conversation. I'm sorry, I should introduce Lauren Lehman, who is, is next to me. Lauren is a staff attorney in the Secretary of State's office and provides counsel for many of our professions, including motor vehicle racing. So Lauren and our inspector have started going to uh, it was the Fair Association meeting. They attended a, a, a dinner this fall uh, to try to inform people and say, look, we, we have these laws on the books. We need to start making sure we're all in compliance. They started the conversation early, hopefully, to get some of these issues to the fore before fair season uh, and before um, so that people have time to, to come around and to come into compliance. Um, so that conversation has started, and, it, and I think it took some people by surprise, and um, our new inspection process kind of took some people by surprise. We learned along the way uh, that we needed to give people a lot more notice than we were. And again, I'll say it's not our intention to put any track or, or demolition derby out of business. Um, we're willing to listen. We want to work with these parties, um, and we want to help hopefully get people into compliance rather than kind of bring down a hammer and shut, shut people down. We're going to take into account that certain practices have existed over the years. So as Senator Benning pointed out, there are some places with a long track record, excuse, excuse the pun there, uh, a track record of, of no injuries, uh, no deaths, no uh, serious problems. Um, but I'll just say we had an incident just over this last year at a track with no history of any problems. And so it can happen to anyone at any time. Um, Just for the record, Chris, can we all agree that was at Thunder Road? Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> so I'm uh, just saying that the, the, the long history of no injury is not the sole factor that we would use in, in determining whether you know, the, the current setbacks are, are the right setbacks. We are not experts. We are not engineers. We are not physicists. We don't, you know, we we don't know whether that 30 feet is a reasonable distance or not. That was what was put on the books at the time. Lauren's done some research into other states. Maybe you could, could speak yeah. to that a little bit. Um, so, in kind of taking it back, I think the standard our office works from is there's one in statute in Chapter 57 about any rules that our office issues need to be the minimum necessary to protect the public safety. And so while we don't have the legislative or regulatory history uh, off the top of our head about where, why this 30-foot 30 um, uh, foot setback is in place, we have to assume that at the time these rules were developed, they were established as the minimum necessary to protect public safety. And so if we were to deviate from that 30 feet, which you know, if you look at the rules as they are set up, there's a motor vehicle section which addresses motor vehicles and doesn't have this 30-foot setback. They have other rules and requirements Thunder Road did for barriers between spectators and the tracks. These rules were developed specifically for demolition derbies and are very specific as to the 30-foot setback from the grandstand. Um, and so our office has to make an assumption, especially given the summer, that if these are the minimum for public safety, if that was what was developed at the time, and, we need, and we're being asked to make an exemption from that, but we don't have any evidence that making an exemption won't increase the risk to the public safety. We've looked at not a lot of other states, alternatively, regulate motor vehicle racing and demolition derbies the way our state does. They leave it to insurers. They leave it to third-party accreditors like NASCAR. Um, the National Hot Rod Association. So, um, but the states that do, New Jersey has a 45 foot setback specifically, or a 50 foot, excuse me, 50 foot setback specific to demolition derbies. Um, and one insurance policy that I could find was 45 feet setback. Those are current rules drafted in the last, um, since 2014. Um, and so, well, that's not a, that, those are kind of anecdotal um, pieces of evidence. That is something that kind of says 30 feet is not outside of the ballpark, um, or outside of the racetrack, if you will. Um, and you know, and then it, also back to anecdotal, we do have videos, there are things online, there are incidents every year in demo derbies where there's a fire, there's um, some part of the car, which even though the cars are very stripped down, there's mud flying, there's debris fly flying. So those are things that, from our office's perspective, 
when we look at the rules, they're the minimum to protect public safety. If we create a waiver, if we change the rule, you know, I personally would feel uncomfortable doing that without evidence that we're not putting public safety at risk. Do you, does the office have the authority to create a waiver at this point? We do. The rules specifically create an opportunity if there's a topographic um, reason, Perhaps a type the of evaluation. Sorry, right elevation. Um, I know Caledonia County Fair, have, their stands are set back and higher up, so that's a possibility. Again, though, it comes down to how we don't have the expertise to evaluate where that, what is safe. Why is it the way right. And so we, what we have to work from are these rules, which we assume are developed with that standard in mind, that they are the minimum necessary to protect the <coughs> uh, Lauren, can I first ask, do you know of anybody that is currently running a demo derby that has been denied insurance for that? In Vermont, no. I think we've seen some vendors, images from vendor um, uh, events held at some fairgrounds that were very out of compliance with the rules and did not even seek a permit. Um, so I think there's some of that going on in the state. Okay, but as far as insurance companies are concerned, <coughs> are you aware of any fair that was denied coverage? The only way our office, no, I'm not, so that's direct, but the only way our office would become aware of that is if somebody applied for a permit or a license where we require um, insurance documentation at that time. So if an event took place without seeking a permit um, or under another, um, another uh, venues or tracks permit, we would not receive the insurance information. But the, the fares themselves, as far as I know, and the tracks have all submitted um, documentation of insurance. With respect to this rule, Rule 5, that covers demo derbies, you indicated that racetracks, Thunder Road type racetracks, are covered under a separate rule. Do you know what the setback requirement is for racetracks like Thunder Road? I'm going to ballpark this a little bit with the numbers. I know it's Rule 3. Um, they have to have a, a four foot minimum concrete barrier around the track. They also need a tire fence, a minimum of eight feet right up the track, and there's different depth requirements as well. And then they need um, a separate four-foot spectator fence that's 25 feet back from the, the railing fence, and then the actual city needs to be 50 feet back. So they have three or four barriers plus a 50-foot setup. Okay. And to not conflate this with racetracks in general, uh, I think we all understand and agree that the incident that happened at Thunder Road, the injuries happened despite that rule requirement. Is that correct? That is not correct. So I think um, what, what Chris was speaking about, the grandfathering and inconsistent inspections, that track we had worked with in July um, because they too had not been, they had been told 20 years, we've been grandfathered, why do we need to be in compliance now? We tried to work with them to establish um, a timeline for compliance, um, and then that event took place before they were able to come into compliance. So we had actually granted them the waiver based on that argument of, it's been 20 years, there's been no injuries, so why would we do something now? So that's why I think we come here being a little bit more reluctant to do a waiver, even though there's been no incident in 20 years. And the demo rules were developed specifically for the demos. Um, you would agree with me, would you not, that at the time the Caledonia <coughs> County Fair Grandstand was built, A, it was built as a result of an arson that destroyed the previous grandstand, and it was built and operated with a demo derby since that time, even though this rule existed since the mid 1990s. When was the? Uh, I'm not, when was the? This I believe was it was the, 1994 that that. But I'm sure Dick will be able to tell us in a moment. So that would be five years prior to when these rules went into effect. And I'll just. Um, I think you bring up a great. Point, Senator Benning about the insurance. What we, what I think we don't know yet is whether the insurance is relying on that state stamp of approval that's saying, well, if the state says they're okay, then we can insure them. So it would be really interesting to me to know if they would insure if the state didn't regulate demolition derbies, if the insurance company would, would do that. I think that's how it works in some other states because there is no regulation. 
um, we're open to that conversation as well. I just want to say that we're very open-minded about this. If we can get some evidence uh, from an expert that says that it's safe, that setback distance is fine, those Caledonia stands because of the height, um, no one's in danger of getting hit by debris, and there's no way that a car could get up and over into that area, um, we would definitely listen to that and be willing to, to take another look at our rule and, and perhaps a waiver. Mm -hmm. so ball, ballpark and how many fairgrounds we're talking about? I think um, so that's five. I that's why Jackie Folsom is here to give us that. We have seven of them that have, seven of, of our 14 fairs have demolition derbies currently, and three of them ran into issues with the inspections this year. We are non compliant with Correct. this rule. So, one of Thank the, you. sorry, we, um, one of the, Fairs we work with this year, and we spoke with our advisors, we motor vehicle <coughs> racing advisors, and we, none of them, they've all very familiar with derbies, they don't participate in them. Um, and they, you know, were comfortable dis discussing options with elevation as well as distance. Um, their race car drivers are not engineers, um, and, but, you know, they were comfortable with me sharing with you guys today that, um, you know, from their opinion, there should be some setback, that um, there may be a catchment fence would be sufficient, maybe clearing the first two rows. I think Rutland did that this year at the Vermont State Fair. They cleared the first two rows to have that necessary setback. We're willing as an office to look at a lot of options to make this work and to accommodate. We don't want to shut things down, but, you know, again, looking at that public safety, what can be done with the system, the infrastructure that's in place. I, I take it we all agree that this is a conversation that should be held in front of a committee of jurisdiction to take all this kind of evidence. I don't know how familiar you are with the LCAR process, but our yes. jurisdiction is very limited. Absolutely. We, we, could, we could even have this conversation, and we plan to have this conversation with the, the fair association, with the track, uh, sorry, the fair owners, um, and we might make changes outside of any need for legislative intervention. Okay. Well, yeah, um, uh, topography has come up a couple times, but also then sometimes the word elevation gets used. So in here, uh, I'm looking at 517 sub D, and it just says topography of the land outside the event area. So I'm not sure where elevation is in anything that we're talking about. And it sounds like topography, it's a shall require deviation, so not so much that people were talking about but something that would get you up and higher but um, just reading it like an editor saying we're saying two things are related but only one of them is in black and white on the page any further questions this point we may call you back up, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, we could hear from our other two witnesses. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about Rule 5.1.7. My name is Jackie Folsom. I'm the um, lobbyist for the Vermont Fairs and Field Days Association. This is um, Mr. Lawrence, who is on the uh, schedule. He will be speaking. And this is Jason Sicard, who is uh, president of the Orleans County Fair. Mr. Lawrence is president of Caledonia County. Um, we have 14 fairs in our association. Out of them, seven fairs currently hold demolition derbies. Caledonia, Orleans, Vermont State Fair, Addison, Champlain Valley, Franklin, and Deerfield. Each of these fairs has been under the impression for the past several years their events were in compliance with rules. They had all been visited and inspected, and everyone signed off on allowing the events to occur. This all changed, as you heard from um, Mr. Winters, uh, this past year when more strict interpretation and new inspectors visited the fairs and required sometimes significant changes to be made and sometimes on very short notice. Fairs deemed in compliance were Addison, Champlain Valley, Franklin, and Deerfield, although there were some minor deficiencies noted and easily to be corrected for 2020. 
Our association requested members of the Secretary of State's office attend our meeting last, last month, which they did, and we had a great conversation with, with them. Several issues were addressed, including uh, a visit which resulted in a late start for the event and loss of some income for the Vermont State Fair in Rutland. Um, I've spoken with Chris and with Lauren, and we've agreed to work together and try to resolve many of these issues. But unfortunately, there are three fairs directly affected by Rule 5.1.7b, which dictates a fence shall be placed not closer than 30 feet to the barrier required and must refrain spectators. Spectator fences must be properly policed to ensure that spectators do not come inside the fence or come within 30 feet of the barriers at any time. The Vermont State Fair did not meet this guideline when inspected just prior to their demolition derby, and consequently much time and effort was spent on moving Jersey barriers to reach the 30-foot requirement. Their inspection sheet reads, initially Jersey barriers were 16 feet from spectators, then moved to increase that distance. Jersey barriers were still closer than 30 feet to the spectator fencing, but spectator seating was 30 feet from the barriers. Inspection and moving of these barriers took nearly three hours and resulted in a delay of their derby. Additionally, the only way for them to meet the inspector's demands was to remove, remove two rows of seating in the grandstand which had already been sold, causing a financial loss of approximately $1,000, as well as the challenge of dealing with angry fairgoers who had purchased separate tickets for the grandstand event. Their event was allowed to occur, however, the Jersey barriers are still around 20 feet from the spectators and the ring is as narrow as the promoter can get. Going to the full 30 feet buffer would require losing prime seating as well as nearly $4,000 in revenue. Inspectors also told the fair they would have to install a fence at the 30 foot mark, although we are not sure that was requested at Caledonia and Orleans. The Vermont State Fair projects loss of between ten dollars and $15,000 in revenue for the two demo derbies they host during the fair, as well as a 4th of July event that brings in almost $25,000 in revenue if all three of these events had to be canceled due to inability to make changes to the rule. The loss of revenue from the fair events alone is estimated to be 25% on a total annual revenue of $402,000. They were given the go-ahead to hold their event, and their form currently shows no deficiencies. However, estimates for installing the fence at the 30-foot buffer area is between $15,000 and $20,000. Orleans County Fair in Barton is one of two fairs which will have significant issues in attempting to comply with the 30-foot distance required in the rules. Their poured concrete foundation of the grandstand is the innermost retaining wall for the event area, and the opposite area is constrained by a bandstand and judging area. In response to questions, Orlean County Fair noted that their demolition derby accounts for 60% of their annual revenue of $260,000. With gate receipts for that event at $82,500, concessions during the event at $4,200, and sponsorship at $10,000. Their estimated cost to meet the current mandated rules for the demolition derby to continue is, is projected to be $104,000. This amount includes loading out the gravel on the old racetrack bed and purchasing and laying down clay, buying more Jersey barriers, moving the stage and the judging stand, and permitting costs. The fair has determined that unless there was significant assistance from somewhere, they would not be able to make the changes and continuance of the fair would be questionable. Caledonia County Fair has some of the same issues with Rule 5.1.7b. Dick Lawrence, president of the fair, will give you a report about the challenges for them, and then we'll continue. Okay. If I may, may I just be sure you all have copies of this, the violation? I'm sure you do. The highlighted items are the items that the uh, Office of Professional Regulation have indicated, this is their highlighted, were the problems or the concerns that they had by uh, our whole organization by not meeting those highlighted uh, conditions. Secondly, if I may, Mr. Chair, I have prepared pictures just to try to help you understand our problem. May I pass those around? Yes. Okay. And each law is uh, by itself, so take one and pass them on if you'd be so kind. I have one for myself. And I have other pictures as well, but uh, I think the important part is you need to understand before we get into much. And I understand your authority, but I think before you make that decision as to what role you might want to take in making a recommendation, you understand what our concern is. So once you all get copies uh, of what I have, and 
I've had 10 copies. Did I miss some somewhere? Yeah. Maybe we, there we go, okay. So the first picture uh, shows our grandstand, which was rebuilt in 1995 as a result of uh, Assen in 1993. And before we built that grandstand, we talked to the Vermont Racing Commission and asked them, can, at our present location, which was an old wooden grandstand, uh, what setbacks do we have to have? Uh, the answer was, you give us what you can do and we'll see what we can accommodate you to. We sent the existing grandstand, the new one, back eight feet further than the wooden one was. Obviously, it still does not meet the setbacks. Uh, I won't get into details, but I did have conversations with the Vermont Racing Commission at that point. Uh, the information that I got from that was destroyed in a uh, fire that I had at the Agway store because I kept the records there, and that was in uh, 2005. But if you look at that first picture, you can see the barriers on by the, by the grandstand. You can see the barriers by the stage. Now, the second picture is exactly the same as the first, but it did not show in good detail, I thought, so I lightened the photograph up so you can see there is some distance between the uh, uh, so-called stage area and uh, uh, the barriers, but it doesn't meet the requirements. Third picture in the, uh, if, just, if you're not familiar with demo derbies, here's a picture of it actually going on this past year at Caledonia County Fair. It is a clay sand track that has been built over a period of many years to get the right consistency for this uh, event, and uh, uh, we water it down for the event. The last stage is pictures taken from previous years that I just thought were might be something to look at until you could understand how that might um, be run. So thank you for allowing me to present that. I hope that gives you a little bit better idea of what a demo derby is if you have not familiar with it to begin with. So members of the committee, thank you for allowing us to share our concerns. I am Dick Lawrence, President of Caledonia County <coughs> Fair and a member of the Vermont State Fair Association. Safety is the utmost concern for all fairs having demo derbies. Derby drivers must meet safety standards by removing all glass in their cars, repositioning fuel tanks, reinforcing the driver's door, and ensuring the car has not lost strength due to rust. Pits are monitored, emergency vehicles must be on site during the event, and fire department personnel must be in attendance. Fair security is a priority to ensure spectator safety. One of the many rules required to present a demo is passing a safety inspection administered by the Vermont Racing Commission. For the past several years, the Commission has recognized Caledonia as a model in meeting all standards. Our fair has served as a training site for new members of the Racing Commission. Our fair, our fair manages our own demo, and we have more than 25 volunteers involved. At our annual inspection prior to our event, we were visited by members of the Racing Commission, as well as members of the Office of Regulation overseen by the Secretary of State. During this inspection, CCF was told we did not meet the 30-foot setback requirement currently outlined in the rules governing Vermont demos, and we would have to meet that requirement prior to the 2020 season. It has been stated by previous testimony presented by Jackie Folsom, the State Fair Association has met with members of the Office of Regulation, and they stated at our meeting that all current new rules will be enforced with no exception. They also openly stated they believe the current rules, rules governing demos were made to apply to racetracks, not demos. I would like to offer this comparison. Demo cars may reach a top speed of 10 miles per hour. Professional racetracks approach 70 miles per hour. Members of the Office of Regulation have stated they will start the process of rulemaking for demos. This will most likely take two to three years. Members of this committee and the Office of Professional Regulation, please consider the following. I have been involved with the fair business for 34 years. I have no knowledge of any serious spectator injury during that time. I hope that record will continue. There is never a bad weather day for Demo Derby. They take place rain or shine. This is positive for both the fair and the vendors. There is no consideration in existing setbacks regarding elevated spectator seating. In my view, an elevated seat would be much safer than a seat at ground level. 
A grandstand, grandstand provides safe, spectator safety for the event, as well as providing spectator comfort in rain and sunshine. Elimination of the demo at CCF would result in an estimated gate revenue of the day of the demo of $40,000. Vendors would lose the busiest day of the fair. Both are necessary to ensure a fair success. Relocation of a Cal Caledonia County Fair Grandstand, which was destroyed by fire in 95 and rebuilt at a cost of $450,000 on moving the stage area is not a consideration. Preparing a new demo derby is costly. Preparing a new surface and installing jersey barriers and fence would be in the $50,000 range. In, the, in addition, the loss of grandstands feet would discourage spectators from attending. For years, I have been a strong supporter of Vermont agriculture. The 14 fairs and field days in Vermont is an ideal location to promote the importance of agriculture and keep people connected to the rural community. Continuation of the demo derbies will cre create income that will allow that to happen. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I sincerely thank you for allowing this hearing to be held. I hope you will understand the importance of this issue to our organizations. Safety is vitally important. It is a priority. Fair survival is as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask for clarification before Jason takes up the whole here? Um, Dick, you asked if we had a copy of this, and the yes. committee has been provided with that one page. But there is another page that defines the term spectator, and I just wanted to enter on the record for you all to hear. Spectator means any person who holds a general admission ticket, special admission ticket, or other kind of ticket or permit purporting to grant that person entrance to any part of the event area or pit area. With that, Dick, I need to ask you a question about your first picture. On the right-hand side of the picture is the area where I know Reg Lucier is normally calling the event. Yes. He is also the person who will stop the event in the event that there is a fire or some problem that needs to be immediately attended to. Is that correct? That is correct. In addition to him, though, there are several, uh, uh, what did we say, people that administer the program that are on the sides of the track. If they see something, they notify Reg and he officially stops it. But we have horns if a fire occurs or someone looks like he uh, is not holding up well in the pit. Horns will blow, everything will stop at that point. And do all of those individuals fall within the definition of spectator as currently interpreted? In not the way I understand it, but I don't, I have not had conversation with anybody in a formal uh, discussion, Joe. Okay. Um, would you have any understanding of whether or not the people on that stage, on the right hand side of the picture, are people who would normally fall within the definition of spectator if? the um, office decides to interpret it that way. Yes. And so... You know, there would be people on that stage that would come on the definition of spectator without doubt. And There's also a reason for us, it may be at this point, to say that that should be eliminated. And this might be a position we all might benefit from. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, what, what should be eliminated? The definition yeah, of definitely spectator spe or we putting could, those people We on allow the stage. sponsors yes. to come up and stand at the rear of the stage. Yeah. That is still closer than 30 feet to the barriers. It's on an elevated stage. But if people give us sponsorship dollars, we allow them to come up with their families and not be at the front of the stage, at the rear, to observe. This is part of getting money. You've got to give something to get something. Right. And so the only person up in closer to that would be the announcer. And in this case, he mentioned Mr. Lucia, who does the uh, announcing and has control of the event. Is is it better to have him closer to the event as opposed to farther away if he would be the person who's looking for smoke, for instance? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But he would not, in my mind, would not be called a spectator because he did not pay to get there, okay? That's my interpretation at the moment. Until such time as I'm told differently, I'm going to go on that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Seacard. I'm president of Orleans County Fair, and I appreciate the opportunity that's been presented to us and all the other fairs to speak on behalf of it, this issue as it concerns all of us. Um, the, discuss the discussions thus far are, are good to see. Economics are absolutely our survival instinct in this. The true issue here is about safety. None of us want an incident. 
Uh, so we have reviewed our safety record. Research dating back to 2009, OCF has had no record injuries of spectators. Demo derbies at Old Orleans County Fair date back to 1974. My first attendance to a derby was in 1977, but as yet I've never been the contestant. No, now back to economics. This rule adherence drive will be a deterrent to the survival of Old Orleans County Fair. Please understand we are a truly devoted group providing agricultural fair events, which include proud show persons of all ages to include 4-H programs, educational competitions, maple products, and great community gathering place. In 2019, we saw over 300 head of cattle and over 150 horses, as well as many other animals. Our contestants for the demo average over the last four years of 127 participants. And the stands hold 2,500 people and bring us 3,200 community members to the table to watch this event. Economics are very difficult for our facility that has marked 152 years of service. We have 29 buildings. Take a thought of your home maintenance. A new roof, $5,000, that, that's a lot of money for a home. With 29 buildings and three times the size of a home, that would run our expenses up to $400,000 to replace all the roofs in one year. We rely heavily on the Vermont stipend and project grants annually of about $30,000. It is not enough to keep up with all our main, with all our maintenance and vision adjustments. So our burdens are extensive. Adding to our adjustment, our track design, and accommodating buildings to move, we estimate $104,000, with the annual setup costs increase of $3,200 per year. Many, many, many volunteers have consistently run our county fair. Orleans County Fair has 8,000 volunteer year hours annually, which in the marketplace, if that was to be spent, would be about $260,000. We have an unbelievable team that provides a strong, super strong safety track record. We want to commend the past generations that have provided these events for the community and the inspectors that have done their work. I think they've done a remarkable job to give us that safety record. To state that we have no we have no uh, validation of is it really safe or not safe is frustrating when we can show proof of our record. This adherence to a 30-foot spectator requirement could be a regulation enforcement without justification. I remind all the demo at our facility has operated for 45 years. Again, no spectator injury for at least 10 years from my research. If you take the opportunity to provide us a waiver, it will be greatly appreciated. But know that if we take that into account and say we're going to remove seating, our seating removal will amount to 990 persons out of a 2,500 seat facility. That's an income of $14,850 just on gate admission and nothing that would be spent towards the vendors. So we respectfully request an adjustment on paper so we may continue to operate our safely maintained event. We also request to a party of all the process about these matters. We thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. I just want to note that we have a minute and a half left of scheduled meeting time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure committee members will be willing to stay and, and a little longer to, to resolve this, but I just want to note, note that. Uh, Senator Can I just Jack? ask a quick question? Jason, um, you've provided an aerial view, but not a ground level view, and I'm looking at uh, Dick's example of the height requirement, sorry, the height of the stands. Are your stands similar to that? Do you have any idea what your... Yes, so our, our stands are, are actually, I think, higher, but are closer to the track. Our track and our grandstand, when you look at that aerial view, yeah. that's, that's the edge line. So when I go up into the grandstand, I have to stand on top of the Jersey barrier and reach the floor to get up in. So what would that be? That would be three, uh, eight, about nine feet, 10 feet off the ground. 
And maybe that is similar to yours. I'm, I'm very close. So our 30 foot setback works in all other areas except for the grandstand. So, I, oh, <laughs> <laughs> your, your timer that you were working on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, as, as you know, the, the actions that, that this committee can take are very limited. Um, and I just, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Mr. Chair, but I, I did spend some time speaking with motorsports companies that do promote derbies, mm -hmm. and, and I won't read through everything, but what they, all three of them said, and it was um, JMM Motorsports, um, Skyfire Productions, and Sarge Demo Derbies, some of which have uh, accounts here in Vermont. Um, they all said that they know of no industry standards across the nation in regards to demo derbies. And what they do depend on is their insurance companies um, asking them what they feel is comfortable and safe, and that's what they go on. So our suggestion uh, in regards to this challenge for the, the three fairs, and actually all of them, would be perhaps instead of having a, a specific standard that doesn't exist anywhere else, except in, in New Jersey they do have a 50-foot barrier, as was noted by Lauren. Um, to request that perhaps one of the ideas could be that the insurance companies of the promoters of the, of the uh, demo derbies or the fairs, which promote their own, would have on file their insurance that, that indicates the uh, safety issues that they require to put on so that this would give an, the ability for a little bit more flexibility for the fairs. Barring that, we would ask for waivers, and I know that isn't probably under your purview, and we would have to go back to the committees of jurisdiction, but that's what we're looking for. We do know that the Secretary of State, as Mr. Lawrence mentioned, plans on holding some rule revision discussions over the next two or three years. Unfortunately, if you, as you've listened to the economic issues that three of the fairs will have, that's not going to work for them in, uh, in 2020. Thank all, you for your time. The, uh, the political remedies. Rulemaking well, committees of jurisdiction are all drawn out. Right, processes, we understand. Fortunately, just another quick question, Jackie. Do you have any information of any fair in Vermont that has been denied coverage for their demo? No, I do not. Thank you. Our insurance company inspects our grounds and know know the events that we have. We have to re provide them with, with numbers of people in attendance, and they're they're full aware of what they're supporting and in their risk. So, in the interest of time, I just to to state the actions available to our committee. One would be to do nothing. Another would be to send letters of, of uh, to the committees of jurisdiction, urging them to promptly take up this issue and, and provide remedy if they get testimony, provide remedy if they see fit. Um, third option would be to object to the rule, changing the legal status of the defensive rule. Um, and uh, and I think that those are our remedies. The, you have ongoing discussions with the Secretary of State's office, which is we would encourage as well, but uh, outside our jurisdiction. Sure. Um, so within our limited palette of, of action, um, I'd like to make a motion. I'm sorry, Senator Bennett. May I just want, I want to uh, clarify one uh, issue in regard to objection that under statute and your rules, objection is a two step process essentially. There is the if you are considering objection, um, the first step is to object. The next thing that happens is that LCAR alerts the agency of the objection, and the agency is given a chance to respond and then you consider that response and then determine whether to certify your objection to the Secretary of State's office. It's only after you would vote to choose to certify that the burden would shift to uh, the agency if the rules there after challenge. I just want to make sure that that is uh, clear. Mr. Chair, given our limited jurisdiction, let me say first that if this rule were coming to us for the first time as a brand new proposed rule, I think there is legitimate argument to make that this rule would be both arbitrary and overly expensive and not within the legislative intent as far as safety is concerned. Um, my intent here is to simply do two things. 
One is to say that we object to Rule 5.1.7b, which is the paragraph that talks about the 30-foot restriction. I have no desire to eliminate any of the other language in that rule because I think it speaks to the safety question. But that one particular paragraph is what the obstacle is for these particular fares. In doing that, I do understand that the certification question has to come up, but that's the first step of my two-part motion. The second part would be to immediately send letters to communities of jurisdiction asking them to take this matter up as soon as possible uh, because I do think that this discussion needs to happen in a place where proper testimony can be taken as to what the impact on the fares would be. And that's something that would normally have happened had this been brought for the first time. As it happens, it's done backwards. We're facing a rule that's been on the books for quite a while. It has never been enforced. But I don't think at the end of the day it's any different for our perspective. Uh, we have the ability to call up the rule and ask whether it meets legislative intent. I don't think it does. I think we need to have it dealt with in the committees of jurisdiction. But LCAR does have the power to get the ball rolling by moving to say we object to that particular provision. So my two-part motion is that we object to 5.1.7b. That's the first part of the motion. The second part is that we send letters to the communities of jurisdiction asking that they address this question. Yes. And may I confirm, Senator Benning, did you uh, state that your objection is based on the idea that the rule is yes, arbitrary and contrary to the intent of the legislature? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this this is the rule that's in, in place now, isn't it? It is, but it's never been enforced until recently. Council? Yes, sir. Do, do we object to rules that have been put in place? Um, you may. Um, 3 BSA section 817 subsection D of the APA says that in addition to LCAR's powers under 842, which is your standard objection authority to proposed rules, LCAR may, quote, in similar manner, conduct public hearings, object, and file objections concerning existing rules, and that a rule reviewed under this subsection remains in effect until amended or repealed. But the objection, if certified, would have the same effect of shifting the burden um, to the agency if the rule is thereafter challenged. So I am in complete agreement with the second part of your motion. The first part makes me very uncomfortable because I don't feel like we have the background information to determine whether the rule is arbitrary or contrary to legislative intent. I feel like we're jumping into the middle of it and there's... I'm happy to divide the question Mr. Chair, um, and if I may address your first concern. If this had been brought to us as a brand spanking new rule, we have evidence before us that demonstrates at least three fares would be immediately impacted to a substantial degree, to a great expense. We would normally be looking at a rule and asking ourselves, if the statute says reasonable rules shall be adopted, and that rule that has now been adopted is unreasonable given the history of the conduct of these fairs, I don't think we would hesitate to decide we have a problem with that and want to have it sent back for further conversation. That's the intent of my motion. I'm not seeking at this point uh, to say that we have all the evidence necessary to deal with that issue. I think that we do. I think that we have some jurisdiction. But normally, that kind of conversation would have taken place long before today. It has evidently not ever taken place, because if it had been taken place and the rule had been enforced, these folks would never be in the pickle that they are in. 
they are in a pickle and it will substantially impact them. Therefore, I come to the conclusion that the rule, now being enforced the way it is, is not reasonable, which is what the statute <coughs> asks them to uh, do. So it, I, that's my concern. You obviously know where my vote will be on that question. I will be happy to divide the question in two um, in order to take them to the Senator Bray, did you have a question? Well, I was going to ask if we could divide the question. So thank you, Senator Bray, for making that offer. And for the very reasons you cited, there's, there's, it seems hard to judge after the fact, especially for rule and operation for many years, that it's unreasonable when we don't know the prior conversations. We've heard some testimony to the fact that other states have um, greater setbacks. We haven't heard anything about smaller setbacks. So I'm entirely sympathetic. Or about how. Right, um, or elevation. elevation. Like that. So I'm entirely sympathetic to the plight. I'd like to see us resolve it, but I don't want to, um, with so little information, uh, object to a, a long-standing rule. Doesn't seem like we're at. Personally, I, I couldn't vote yes to object. On the other hand, trying to get um, uh, find a path forward is um, would be happy to work on that in whatever ways we can, uh, including a letter to the research jurisdiction. I'd just like to respond, Chris. That I know the rule has been long-standing. Yep. But as you heard from the Secretary of State's office, it has only recently been enforced, which is why we find ourselves in the pickle that we're in. Um, so I'm looking at this not as something that's been long standing and is there for a given reason, because it's never been enforced until recently. And that is what really has me falling down to say, this is not reasonable. Can I, well, so one quick response would just be that there's been enforcement. The degree to which things are enforced and how they've been interpreted or exemptions or, I mean, it seems like there's been some shades of gray and exemptions, waivers, grandfathering. I'm just feeling like I'm skating out on thinner and thinner ice to say, oh, we know how it's been regulated in the past and now we're going to object to the rule. So, Senator Benning, it seems to me, and I know you'll respond, um, <laughs> that uh, um, objecting to the rule, our, our, our goal, and I think it's a shared goal by everybody here, is to find a remedy that works for, for not just the three affected pairs, but going forward for everybody. Uh, I think that's a shared goal. I do not see how objecting to the rule provides remedy. It seems to me that it ratchets up pressure a little bit, but it does not provide a remedy. Robin, the, the remedy in the short term to me would be if we end up objecting and certifying our objection, that if the issue were to be forced upon the fairs and the fairs chose to object and appeal that decision to a court of law, our objection was certified to a reviewing court, and Betsy Ann, you correct me if I'm wrong, that the burden of demonstrating that this is reasonable falls now upon the agency to demonstrate that. That takes some of the, uh, I guess, well, it certainly takes the burden of proof off of the fair associations who are immediately impacted, but they then provide evidence to a reviewing court and the burden is always at that point on the Secretary of State's office to demonstrate that this has to be enforced this way as a reasonable one of the statute. Um, that is important in my eyes because we have no idea what the committees of jurisdiction are going to do and when. Assuming everybody works together, that process will take testimony, in the committees of jurisdiction, suggestions. I'm hoping that the conversation will uh, go well with the Fair Association and the Secretary of State's office. They will come up with ideas and try to resolve it. We have no idea when that's going to happen. The concern is immediate because these fairs are going to be having this impact this summer. 
And if we leave the rule to be enforced in the way it is, uh, I am imagining that your ability to secure insurance for these events under that rule being imposed the way that it is might be problematic and would be a tremendous hardship to the fair associations. So I don't want to leave it that we expect things to work in the right way. I want to have this committee's limited jurisdiction give it the extra push necessary to have that conversation move forward. <coughs> Senator McDonald, I appreciate the Senator's concerns and the goals he's trying to resolve. Um, we do not set policy, and I don't think we bring up rules that have been in place um, and in one hearing um, object to them when we have ample time to hear more testimony in order to get commitments from the committees of jurisdiction. And um, if this was April or May, and the committees of jurisdiction, even late February, had ignored what was going on, you know, the decision makers, and they said policy, then this committee might very well follow the, the guidance of the, the senator from Caledonia. Um, but I hope that we would postpone action on this matter until we've had a chance to communicate with our colleagues on the committees of jurisdiction and seek their commitment to resolve it. So I would move to postpone action on this item now. And I don't believe there's a member of LCAR that doesn't um, wouldn't work to resolve it. And um, but I wouldn't rush to uh, do something that is not um, in our traditional jurisdiction unless the time constraints um, left us with that only option. Just a quick question. Who, which committees of jurisdiction would be involved in this issue? I think it would likely be the GovOps committees because it's an OPR uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. GovOps normally handles OPR issues. How about transportation? Perhaps. Or both. Or both. Yeah. In a subsequent meeting, we might check around and give some advice on which committees we thought would be best suited to deal with the, what the center has, has brought to us. Asking the fair associations, what's what? It, I, I would assume that you have already scheduled next summer's events. Yes, I was a, as he spoke, that was a, something I wanted to speak to. So in a business, we all we all react to the market and what happens and, and make our adjustments. So we've already got contract commitments for entertainment. So we're going to have to break contracts or, or go it. And if this goes south, we're not going to be able to meet those commitments, and it will be the end. I'm sure, sure that uh, the other fairs have already have commitments on entertainment as well. And entertainment is uh, is not cheap. You know, it's easily hits a marker of seventy thousand dollars, and you know we have bookings for even twenty twenty one. So it's it's a lot of investment of time and a hardship and uh, troubling to the volunteerism that supports these fairs to have yet another struggle. And, and I, I don't completely understand your processes, but I'm just trying to, to explain that there's a, a, a quite an urgency for us to understand how we're going to how we're going to move forward. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to clarify. So so in terms of um, in terms of legislative action or, or the remedy um, to, to be blunt, I mean, you're you're screwed now. <laughs> and, uh, and, That's why I came. <laughs> and in that respect, it doesn't. Uh, whether relief comes in in uh, February or May um, is kind of a matter of degree. You still have to act as though it's coming to, in order to pull off a successful event. So does does it change 
your actions at all? I request funding. I'm sorry? Funding. You, you would request funding. It's the only way we can do it. You mean for infrastructure changes? Yeah, we have to make the infrastructure changes. And we don't have a checking account that supports that. Right. Our community is, does phenomenal at sponsoring the fee, and I, I can't see that they're going to provide us enough continue funding to, to make those adjustments. Representative Lawrence, the fares I'm getting money from the institu institutions correct. bill, yes. correct? Yes. Not a whole lot, if I remember correctly, from my years there. Well, the fares somewhere between 200 and 225 is usually where it goes. Total. Total for the 14 for fares the 14 in field days. Fares. Right, if you break that down uh, for capital improvements, which is where the money comes uh, through the capital bill. Uh, we generally get between twenty and twenty-two thousand dollars on an annual basis to do capital improvements. And there, that's the only portion of funding from the state legislature that sh that the fairs are getting. No, we also get a stipend fund, which okay. is in the agricultural budget, and uh, that fund again is uh, has a formula how it's uh, divided. And again, uh, that last year we got $10,000 from that. I assume Jason got a similar figure. And right. so uh, there's and, about $100,000 divided by the 14 fares and field days on a formula that is already set. <coughs> so nowhere near what you're anticipating. No, the stipend money, though, has to be done, has to be used in support of premiums and that type of thing. It got, that does not is not meant to go to capital improvements. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the problem that we're facing. This committee does not routinely take up areas such as this on one day's notice. Um, I believe that Senator Bennett is going to probably work as hard as anyone in this legislature to, legislature to find a way through this process and um, to make them, to give the fairs, the fairs the opportunity to know what they're dealing with instead of setting up a possible lawsuit over a rule that we may object to. And I would, um, I would urge us to uh, postpone action on this today until our next meeting. And at that time, um, after consulting with Senator Benny, come up with a date by which this should be resolved. And if it isn't, that um, this committee can take that issue up again and use the, um, the resolution that Senator Benny has put forth if we see that our colleagues um, shrug their shoulders and don't take this up. If I'm clarify, is your motion to uh, postpone all action or to send letters of jurisdiction oh, okay. to the committees yeah. of jurisdiction yeah. postpone and, and, and tell them vote. that we have been asked to consider um, the remedy that Senator Betty has suggested and that we're reluctant to do so until the committees of jurisdiction have spoken out and we're usually reluctant to do something like that at one single meeting, having listened to one group of witnesses. That's as reasonable as they have presented to us their problem. So, Senator Bray. Um, so I'm looking at the underlying statute that drove, uh, I guess, the rulemaking, and the outside portion of all tracks shall be a reasonable distance from the spectators. Somehow that got interpreted to, to mean 30 feet in this case. It, it could be that the nature of the fencing, uh, if it were far stronger or something like that, might shorten the distance. Who knows what who, what went back and forth to turn into 30 feet. But that seems like something that happens in the rulemaking process. Or uh, and it, So it's very hard for me to read that and then this rule and say someone ran afoul and therefore we should object. Um, uh, I'm entirely, again, sympathetic to what we're doing. I'd like to send a McDonald's suggestion. Procedurally, we have a motion on the table. I don't know if Senator Benjamin is willing to withdraw that so that 
Senator McDowell's motion to be considered. I think that's where we are now, unless there are further points of discussion. I, I do have a question, uh, Secretary of State's office. Do you have plans to visit with this group in the near future? Absolutely. We've started the conversation. We want to continue the conversation. As we've heard today, each uh, demolition derby setup is a little bit different, so they're all kind of unique, and there are a lot of different factors that we have to take into account in figuring out whether that 30 feet is met or perhaps something less than that 30 feet would be acceptable given height, fencing, <clears throat> topography, whatever it might be. I think we've got a lot of options to work with here and we hear and understand the urgency uh, that was expressed here today that they have to plan for fair season, they have to start entering into contracts now, so we'll make this a priority in having those conversations and trying to come up with a solution. And if I may follow along, yes. relative to Senator McDonald's comment about time frame here, you are going to be scheduling something sooner rather than later in terms of, and can we ask for a report back from that conversation or we'll ask you to submit some? I will. We certainly will. Or you can do the same. We've yeah. had a conversation already. It was, I understand yeah. that, but I think we oh, no. to be ongoing, happy. absolutely. Uh, Senator McDonald had it. Oh, one of the, the Time frame issues I think many of us are thinking of is the length of rulemaking to change the rule. And this is a health and safety issue. And should the legislature direct and the commission jurisdiction direct new rules for new outcome, they would be remitted by emergency rule, which are quick and immediate and would not hold up this process. It would be an emergency rule which could be implemented immediately, um, quickly, in a timely fashion. So I would hope that if we're going to take, mm -hmm. we're going to discuss this with the committees of jurisdiction, we will make it clear that it's a time frame issue here, that the emergency rules would apply if our council would verify that aspect, and to do it in a way that is, that is we are, the, the, our colleagues expect us to do business here, not to make policy, but to uh, to conform to the statute. And uh, so I, I'm wholeheartedly in support of the Senator Bang's goals and think that this committee should achieve those goals in a less uh, hurried fashion. I had a question about process, and I believe Senator McDonald has answered that question for me. Yes. Um, so, also a process question. Um, if this committee votes to send letters to the committees of jurisdiction, is it possible for the Fairs Association to get a copy of those so that we may also send letters to those same committees? Um, with some of our background information and perhaps with some of the discussion that uh, Mr. Winters and I will be having on behalf of this issue so that we can give them a sense of urgency on this and let them know that this is a top priority for all of us if that's the way that this vote goes. Committee, a letter to committees of jurisdiction is cc to the Fair Association Thank and you. the Secretary of State's office. So I think the question looming is, are you willing to withdraw your motion on the table? Well, from a parliamentary standpoint, I interpreted Senator McDonald's motion as a substitute motion. Um, let me ask a question. Is it possible to put this discussion back on our agenda on the ninth meeting date? in order to get a report on where these folks have ended up, because that may make or break my decision on what I want to do by way of time. Um, I would yeah. welcome that. I think, a productive I think an, an update approach. would be would be welcome. Yeah, because if things have, have gone south there, their immediate problem is much greater than it is today. And there's um, more reason for us to take the motion by the regional bank. So I think we, we are all, would all like an update <laughs> <laughs> uh, January 9th meeting. 
Yeah. So could council state then the motion that's before us? <laughs> <laughs> A couple different motions. There was Senator Benning's original motion to object.